The president of Kenya, William Ruto, uh, hosted top officials of Facebook in the East African country to a meeting that was focused on how to monetize the operations of the social media giant. The interactive meeting, which included feedback, a feedback session, was addressed by the president. Here's some of what he said. The Meta Group are here to work with us on various aspects. Number one, as was said ably here, in a few weeks, in a couple of weeks, many of you will be eligible. The eligibility criteria will be now available for content creators in Kenya. That's a big step in making sure that our content creators, the people who operate in the digital space, have an opportunity to monetize, to monetize their talent, to give themselves additional revenue. And I'm truly grateful to Facebook for working with us this journey. Um, secondly, as I've, I've now gotten a commitment from uh, Clegg and uh, the Meta team that by June all our creators will uh, now have an opportunity to really monetize everything that they do in that space, put ads, make sure they can access Instagram and the, and the, and the uh, commerce around it. And it speaks to our bottom-up economic transformation agenda on making sure that we give everybody a chance right from the bottom. All right, joining us from Johannesburg is uh, Yvonne Mango. She is the Africa economist at Bloomberg. Uh, good uh, afternoon to you. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, with respect to uh, Governor Janiego being reappointed, was there anticipation for that or you know, was it up in the air? Yes, I think news was expected, uh, so it wasn't entirely a surprise. It was well received by investors, as you can imagine. The um, Reserve Bank is considered to be one of the more uh, credible institutions in the country, and uh, it's been well run under uh, Kanyago, so the, re the news was certainly well received by the market. So average inflation, I I'm not <coughs> sure what your, uh, your outlook is for 2024, but I know it's come down from 6.9% in 2022 to about averaging 6% in 2023. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, uh, the expectation is 5%, not sure what your outlook is, but can we attribute that to the uh, Reserve Bank? bank and say that, you know, Janiego's leadership has, you know, led to this reappointment? Well, certainly um, over the past couple of years, uh, monetary policy has been well managed. Um, so he started, um, he was pretty proactive in terms of the tightening cycle when many central banks still thought inflation would be transitory. Um, he started hiking um, and they hiked uh, pretty aggressively, as you may recall, and that helped bring inflation back into the three to 6% target, uh, which we're in now. Uh, so we're seeing an inflation of around 5.3%. Uh, um, and as you've rightly mentioned, that's the sort of area where we expect inflation to be for the remainder of the year. What do you think is the main, I guess, challenge for the uh, Reserve Bank as Hyengo looks ahead to another five years? Is it going to be price stability and inflation or anything else? Well, yes, taming inflation. So that is going to be the, uh, a big challenge, as you're probably aware this year. Um, if we compare our inflation trajectory in Africa generally compared to the uh, rest of the world, inflation still remains pretty elevated in uh, parts of the continent. We still have some central banks hiking, including in Nigeria, as you're well aware. So uh, inflation will certainly be his uh, short term concern, particularly bringing it down to the midpoint of the target, which is where uh, the South Africa's uh, Reserve Bank would like to see it target. Uh, anchored, that is, that's 4.5%. Um, yeah, so that will occupy probably his um, first year um, of the second term, of the third term that is coming back to. All right. I, I want to get to the visit from uh, Wale Adeyemo, the U.S. Deputy Treasury Secretary. He was very bullish mm -hmm. uh, on South Africa. Do you, was that because of you know diplomatic reasons or are there fundamentals that support, support what he's saying? Well, I think following his discussions with authorities, he is seeing uh, reforms in progress and the outcome of those reforms. And that uh, includes, of course, um, the investment we're seeing on the power front, uh, both in renewables and as well as maintenance of existing power plants. And the expectation is that over the short term, we should start seeing the availability of electricity improve. Um, in addition, um, you're probably aware of the logistical challenges the country has faced, um, the expectation um, under 
under the new leadership, which has just been appointed in the past couple of weeks, is that we should start to see a meaningful turnaround on that front. Um, probably the other issue that's affecting South Africa now, that, but that's probably more localized in the Gauteng region, is water. Water infrastructure uh, seems to be failing. Uh, so that's the next crisis for South Africa, but that at this point in time seems to be mainly concentrated in Gauteng. It's very interesting, these uh, issues of basic utilities like uh, electricity and water. So is ESCOM still the main threat facing the economy with the load shedding or would, there be, would it be some, something else? Well, on the national front, yes, um, that, that is the main challenge, electricity. So until that's resolved, growth will underwhelm. Um, jobs or unemployment itself will remain pretty high. So the, the main infrastructure that um, many investors, including households, would like to see a turnaround on is electricity. Moving to Ghana, um, IMF head uh, Kristalina Gorgieva wouldn't comment on the anti-LGBTQ uh, bill, but there are suggestions, though, that if it does pass, it could derail funding from the IMF to Ghana. Do, do you think that's, uh, that's possible? Well, historically, such issues tend to impact project financing. Um, so financing from official creditors, multilaterals, um, to sorry, the point I want to make is it tends to impact funding for government, not project financing. So what you'll find is that um, um, creditors, uh, particularly on the official side, as well as uh, financial or international financial institutions, will seek to direct their funding towards projects as opposed to the budget per se. Um, so you will still see inflows into the country. However, it is redirected, as I've mentioned. I should also mention that while the IMF is important in terms of the endorsement of policy and they do provide funding, it is not the main source of funding that many countries receive. Um, so I'd say watch the multilateral institutions such as the World Bank. I'd also say watch the other official creditors and see what happens in terms of their funding. All right, now, uh, the, Ghana, the Ghanaian CD is the third worst performing African currency after the Nigerian Naira and the Egyptian pound. Does Ghana have to look beyond the IMF for liquidity to, to stabilize the currency? Well, I'd say generally most African countries are looking anywhere uh, to get uh, for an <laughs> yeah. exchange of liquidity. Over the past couple of years, as you probably recall, we first faced this funding squeeze uh, on the continent. Um, the good news from early this year is that we've started to see um, countries uh, return uh, to the Eurobond market. Um, we've had uh, Benin, Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya do so. However, it is selective um, and also rates do remain pretty high. But the anticipation of U.S. rates falling, I guess, is what's leading to this opening up. With regards to uh, Ghana uh, per se, um, yes, um, I'm, I'm sure they'd like um, to seek all sorts of funding, but I think their primary concerns at this point in time is finalizing the restructuring of their debt, um, because until that happens, um, you're not going to see many creditors um, going into Ghana in a big way. All right, that, that is still paramount there. Okay, I heard you mention uh, U.S. rate decisions. We've got a lot of central bank decisions this week. Already heard from the Bank of Japan, Australia. We've got the U.S. tomorrow, Bank of England on Thursday. Um, how do you think these decisions, I guess, will impact uh, currencies on the African continent, considering how import-dependent they are and of capital flows and so on and so forth? Correct. So I think the most important one, of course, is the U.S. Fed and everyone's waiting to see uh, uh, and hear when they plan on um, uh, cutting rates. And uh, indications at this point in time is that that's likely to happen mid third quarter um, of this year. Um, and why that's important is because once they start cutting, um, then, of course, it implies a weaker dollar and it allows for currencies in our part of the world to strengthen um, on a relative basis. Um, so that's um, one of the reasons it's important. Also, um, it does help in terms of the interest rate cycle. So for countries that have managed to get a hold uh, of their, uh, at least contain their inflation rates, um, they're in a better position to pursue um, uh, rate cuts. Um, but as we, as you're probably aware, most countries are still grappling with inflation, many in the double digits region. So even though we are likely to see the US uh, cut this year, it may be um, 2025 before we see most African countries um, begin their cutting cycle. Uh, Yvonne Mango, uh, economist, Africa economist at Bloomberg. Thank you so much for talking to us. We appreciate your time as always.